All right, so here we are with segment three of three. Um, we just finished up looking at specific heat, and now we're gonna shift gears and start to look at matter. So what is matter? Well, matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. All right, well, what's mass? Well, mass is the amount of matter in an object. So right there we see we have a sort of a loop going. And so that's not a very good definition of mass. So let's give a different definition of mass. Mass is resistance to change in motion along a smooth and level surface. So, and this should be easily understood, right? Um, you know, if you think about, especially this time of year, we're going into fall here, we have usually have football. And so usually the big guys, the guys with a lot of mass, they play up front. And that's because it's hard to move them. It's hard to change and move their motion, make them change direction. Um, so anything with a lot of mass means it's going to be hard to move. You can look at furniture if you don't like football. Um, something that's really small to move, like a small box, no big deal. A box full of books has a lot of mass. And of course, it's going to be hard to move it. All right. Well, matter itself breaks into to several things. The first thing we're going to be looking at is substances. So a substance is a particular kind of matter. It's pure. Or it can be a mixture. Right? So a mixture would be more than one kind of matter. So it'd be two different substances mixed together. Now, how do we keep those straight? Well, when we're looking at substances and we're looking at mixtures and in general looking at matter, what we want to be able to do is point out an object, a piece of matter, and break it down by category to whether it's a substance or a mixture. And then we're going to see that those two topics actually break down as well. So substances are going to have a couple of different options and mixtures are gonna have a couple different options. To keep track of all of it, what we look at are properties. And properties are simply words that are gonna describe that matter, they're adjectives. So for instance, physical properties are properties that can be observed and measured without changing the substance. So what are some examples of that? Well, typically I like to pick an object in class. And so for instance, I might say a ballpoint pen. If I look at a ballpoint pen, what are some things that I could say that would describe it without actually breaking the pen. For instance, is it a solid, a liquid, or a gas? And of course we'd say it's solid. It has a specific shape, it has a specific volume, right? It has a mass, if I put it on a scale, I can figure out how many grams it is. It has a color, it's opaque, it's not translucent, I can't see through it, right? Those are all physical properties. Now, some of the other things we might say is, um, it burns or it has a smell or things of that nature, those are actually going to be chemical properties. So chemical properties are properties that can be observed, but only by changing the type of substance. So for instance, if I want to know what temperature the pen melts at, I'm going to have to heat it up and I'll get the melting point of that, right? That's going to be a chemical property or its combustion point when it catches on fire. If I want to know what it's actually made out of, right? So I can see that it's a solid, but I can't tell, is it a, a plastic? Or I might be able to say it's a plastic, but I won't be able to say what type of plastic. So I wouldn't know, is it an ethylene? Is it a, a propylene? Is it, you know, what is it? What type of plastic is it? Is, is it? I can't tell just by simply looking at it or touching it. Um, I might be able to narrow it down from experience, but without burning it, I won't know for sure. So, states of matter. I pointed out that the pen is a solid. Well, that's one of our states of matter. So we have three states of matter. We have solids, which is matter that cannot flow, right? My pen's not flowing anywhere. And it has a set volume, okay? A liquid has a definite volume, but it takes the shape of its container, right? So if you've got a cup of water, then the water has a set volume, but if I take it out of that cup and pour it into a different cup, it can change its shape to fill that container. Now, gases are substances without a definite volume or a definite shape. So gases will expand or contract to fill the space they're in. Now, vapors can sometimes be um, mistaken as a state of matter. Vapors are really gases, but they're liquids at room temperature. So they've converted to gas, right? So we can change phases. We call that states of matter. We can have a phase change. We can go from a solid to a liquid, a liquid to a gas, a gas back. And we'll see that. I've got some a PowerPoint or a slide or two coming up for that. All right. So states of matter then, does it have definite volumes? For the solid, we would say yes. 
For the liquid, we say yes, but for gas, we would say no, right? Definite shape, the solid would be yes. And again, we saw liquids would no, gases would be no. All right, temperature increase. Now, my slide is a, a little bit kind of vague here, I'm not really saying what do I mean by temperature increase. But when I say temperature increase, what I wanna know is, is if I increase the temperature, will the solid expand? Will it grow? Will it get larger? And so we're, as we move in through the different seasons, we know that we can see expansion and contraction with like say doors. Um, a lot, anybody's got screen doors that swell up in the summer or winter and they can't open or they can't close or they don't close all the way or whatever it may be, you know, basically that's what we're doing. We're expanding and contracting. So if I change the temperature for a solid, will it change at all like its shape and of course the answer is here it's a small expansion all right when you think about a door getting stuck it's actually not because it's a solid door all right we're going to find out that it's got something else there going on and that is there's a gas trapped in there so usually we don't see this happening with say an aluminum door it's usually a wooden door or it could just be the wooden pieces around the entryway that the door is having trouble fitting into um, or is getting stuck, it's getting pinched by it. How about liquids? If I heat up a liquid, will it expand? And again, we're gonna say a small expansion. So for solids, it's a very, very small expansion. For liquids, it might be a little bit larger. How about gases? Well, gases is gonna be a large expansion, huge, huge expansion. If we heat up a gas, then we're gonna see that gas expand rapidly. All right, the next thing we look at is compressibility. Can I make a solid any smaller than it actually is? And this can be a little misleading because a lot of times we'll think, oh, I can take a soda can and I can crush it, but you're not crushing the solid, right? You're pushing the air out of the can. Some people will say Nerf ball. Oh, no, Nerf ball won't work either, right? Because that's a little bit of, of pockets of holes of air. And again, when I squeeze it, just like the soda can, I'm just pushing all that air out. So solids are actually not compressible. All right. If you think about when you walk, the whole reason why we change the soles on the shoes and put padding inside our shoe is because when we hit the ground, we would just slam our foot onto the ground. There's no compression there. We'd be absorbing all of that shock into our leg. And so we come up with Air Jordans and air pockets in our shoes and special different materials for the soles of our shoe to give a cushion. And so that cushion is what allows it to compress and, and not take all that abuse into our leg. How about liquids? Are liquids compressible? No, they're not either. And if you, you know, ever looked at brake fluid or hydraulic fluid, that they don't compress. The reason why we use them is because it's easier and you can make a line and mobility rather than a rod. Um, so it's just really just to make things easier from the mechanics uh, point of view, the, the building of the car. How about gases? Are gases compressible? Well, we had a pretty mild summer in my opinion this year, but yes, they are. And that's exactly how your air conditioner works. We use expansion and compression to change the temperature. And we're gonna see a whole chapter relating to that, to gases and volume and temperature and how they relate. All right, now I mentioned we would be looking at the systems of going from a solid to a liquid to a gas. So I've set up three beakers here. Um, in our first beaker, we have a solid, and you can kind of tell because a picture is worth a thousand words. And here we can see, if I can get the mouse to show up here. Here we can see, there it goes. Here we can see we've got like this rigid edge going on there and there so it's not filling its container also notice how each particle is pretty close in space to the other particles right and that's because solids typically form a pattern they're not usually haphazard they're not usually spread all over the place they're typically some sort of pattern going on between the particles in the next beaker we've got a liquid and here we can see it's kind of like here it was taller and now it's not as tall it's kind of fallen down and made sure that it's going all the way against the sides notice there's still a little bit of pattern to the liquid to the particles but again they're a little more random than they were in the solid and then finally in the last beaker we have a gas and here we can see that all the particles have spread out and i've actually put a lid on it to make sure that the gas doesn't escape outside of the beaker all right so what is the process of going from a solid to a liquid well, whenever we go from a solid to a liquid, that means the solid is going to melt. 
All right, how about liquid to gas? Well, a liquid to gas is going to be evaporation. It's going to, so it's going to evaporate. Now, what about going backwards? So if I'm going to go from a gas to a liquid, what do I do? Well, I'm going to condense, all right? So the gas is going to condense to form a liquid. And finally, from a liquid to a solid, we get freeze, okay? Now, you'll see um, different questions in some of the labs that will ask about freezing point or melting point. We need to understand that that point is the same point, okay? So the melting point, say, of ice is going to be zero degrees C. Well, that's the same as the freezing point. The melting point and the freezing point are only denoted by direction. So if I'm heating it up, it's a melting point. If I'm cooling it down, I'd be going through a freezing point. Same thing with evaporation and condensation. Okay? The point is going to be the same point. It's just a matter of what direction on the scale am I going. All right. Whoops. So physical changes then. So we talked about physical properties. We talked about chemical properties. Now we want to look at physical changes. So a change that changes the appearances without changing the composition. So can you think of an example of that? So some typical examples, um, one of the classics would be chopping wood. So if I were to go out the backyard here, we have a fireplace and I have to cut wood every once in a while. So if I were to go downstairs and chop wood, that would be a physical change, right? Some others, boiled water is still water. So if I go from um, solid ice to liquid water, all the way up to a water vapor, so humidity, that's still water all the way across the board. So those are all physical changes. How about chemical changes? This is a change where a new form of matter is formed. And again, I gave the example of chopping wood as a physical change. The chemical example here would be burning that wood. So if I take those logs and I then put them in my wood stove and burn them, the products of that burning would be completely different than the wood itself, right? I end up with some soot and some ash and some CO2 and some heat and some water coming off of there. Um, all of that shows that it was a chemical change. All right, so again, I don't want you to lose the point of what we're trying to accomplish here. So remember, we were talking about matter. And matter, we said, can break apart into substances and mixtures. Okay. Now, it seems like all the stuff we were just discussing may not be related, but it is. We're going to be using physical properties and chemical properties to determine whether or not we have substances or mixtures. So the next thing we're going to look at then is just what is a mixture, right? So a mixture, we said, is made up of two substances. So if I take two things and I mix them together, am I able to vary that composition? Can I change how much is there? And of course the answer is yes. Um, every year when we approach Christmas without fail, I feel like I get that Facebook post that talks about chocolate chip cookies and whether or not you use brown sugar or so much brown sugar or baking soda versus baking powder, um, just changing all the different things that could possibly be in the cookie generates a completely different cookie. So one will be kind of puffy, one will be flat, one will be this, one will be that. Um, and so it just kind of always makes me chuckle because I'm sure nobody looks at that and says, oh, look at all the different mixtures, but I'm a chemistry guy, so I do. Um, anyway, whenever we can vary the composition like that, we call that a heterogeneous mixture. So when we can see the change in the mixture, that's a heterogeneous mixture. So it won't be the same from place to place. So for instance, those chocolate chip cookies, no matter what I do as far as changing those things, I will see a difference in the chocolate chip cookie, but all the chocolate chip cookies, even if I take two different cookies and compare them, I'll see differences in them. And that's because they're heterogeneous mixtures. The other option would be to be a homogeneous mixture. And here that means we have the same composition throughout. So something like freshly mixed Kool-Aid, not the Kool-Aid we might have stuck in the fridge, give it some time and all the particles come out of the solution. I mean, freshly mixed Kool-Aid, that would be a homogeneous mixture. Now, regardless of what type of mixture we have, every part will keep its properties, right? So what I mean by that is we were talking about physical and chemical properties. Well, if I take two things and I mix them together, then each part, even though I've mixed them together, will keep their individual properties. That's by definition for a mixture. Again, it doesn't matter if it's homogeneous 
or heterogeneous. Okay, when I make a mixture, each individual piece of that mixture keeps its own chemical and physical properties. Okay. Now, moving forward, we'll be talking about solutions. And solutions, by definition, are going to be homogeneous mixtures. And we'd like to believe they're mixed molecule by molecule. All right. And I'm looking at the clock here for this chunk. And um, I think we're going to go ahead and press forward. We've got just four slides left. And there's not a convenient breaking point here. So I'm going to just apologize up front. Um, I'll probably go another five, ten minutes tops um, just to go ahead and knock this chunk out. All right. So a solution here. Um, is a mixture, it's a homogeneous mixture that's mixed molecule by molecule, and we can use any state of matter we want. So it could be a solid and a liquid, that's the general example I gave, which was Kool-Aid. It could be a liquid and liquid, something like antifreeze. A gas and gas, something like air, where we have nitrogen and oxygen mixed together. A solid and a solid, something like brass, where we've mixed copper and zinc together. Liquid and gas could be water vapor, right, so humidity. And again, it doesn't matter what that changes are, like as far as what pieces are in the mixture, they all keep their own properties. Now, the nice part about that is, that means if we have a mixture, we wanna separate it out by component, we can using physical means, physical techniques, right? And that doesn't mean it's gonna be easy, it just means that we can. So we can do things like filtration, uh, we can do things like um, evaporation or making a still so we can boil, like to separate water from alcohol. We can get alcohol to come across at a different temperature. Um, there's different things we can do to separate those things out. And again, it doesn't mean it'd be easy. It just means that we can. All right. So mixtures went pretty quick. Substances, this is where we're going to start to get into the heart of chemistry. So substances are going to be elements, right? They're our main form of substance. These are the simplest kind of matter. Now, on chapters coming up, we're going to see that we can break an element apart. So elements are called atoms as individual pieces. We can break an atom down, but that's not considered a substance because we don't consider that matter. We, call it, we consider that particulate matter. So it's a matter of semantics, if you will. But elements are the simplest kind of matter. We can't break them down any farther and still be considered matter, right? Um, and again, that would be atoms at that point. The second type of substance we can have are compounds. Now, compounds are substances that can be broken down, but by chemical methods. So in other words, I can't just boil the water off and separate it out. So if I want to get hydrogen and oxygen from water to break apart, it's going to be a different process than it is to just boil it or use a filtration technique. I can't just filter the hydrogen out of the water. That's not how it works. So if it's a compound, that means they're bound together and it's going to take a chemical method to break it apart. Now, the nice part is, is when we do break them apart, all the properties are going to change completely. In fact, I think it's kind of ironic that hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, when mixed together and then reacted, forms water. Because hydrogen gas is explosive and flammable, and oxygen gas, of course, is explosive and flammable. But when we mix them together to make water, we use that stable water to actually put fire out. Now, when we have a compound that's mixed together like that, and it's an actual bond, we call those molecules. And so you might be going around calling every compound a molecule. We're going to find out in some later chapters that that's not always true, but they are always considered compounds being broken, or compounds bound together. Now, what are some differences between a compound and a mixture? Well, if it's a compound, it's all one kind of piece, right? These pieces are like the little atoms are connected together. So that's a lot different than being a mixture. A mixture can be more than one kind. We could have molecules in there or we could have atoms in there, but they're just mixed together physically. In fact, making a mixture is a physical change, whereas making a compound is gonna be a chemical change. For a compound, there's only one kind. We can't vary how much of each atom is in there. So water doesn't come in different varieties of water, chemically speaking. I know when you go to the store, it can be a little confusing because you can buy distilled water, deionized water, fresh water, pure water, this water, that water, flavored water even. Um, but if we look at water as a compound, it's H2O. That means there's always two hydrogens, always one oxygen. If it's a mixture, we can vary how much hydrogen and how much oxygen are in that mixture together, all right? So hopefully the differences there are pretty easy to see and you won't struggle with that part. All right, so for the last slide here, what we have is just a little game. It's called, which is it?
So I'm going to hit the button. A little picture is going to come up, and you're going to tell me whether you think it's a compound, an atom or an element, or a mixture. Right? So those are your three options. You're only going to use each one one time. So hopefully you can see that. There's little green circles everywhere. And the question becomes is, is that an element, a compound, or a mixture? Right? And of course, because it's the same thing over and over and over again, it must be an element. All right. So hopefully you're one for one. Here comes the second one. So here we can see we have little green circles and then little blue circles. And hopefully I can tell you you've already used element. So now it's a 50-50 compound or mixture. And hopefully you're going with compound. And now you're two for two. So that means the last one we know has to be a mixture. So now I'm going to change the question up a little bit. And is it heterogeneous or is it homogeneous? And so here we can see little green circles and little blue circles. They're not really in any kind of pattern. So that means it must be a heterogeneous mixture. So hopefully you went three for three there. Um, if not, rewind, look through it, write up some questions if you have them, send them off to me, email, shoot me a text if you need to. All right, and that completes this chapter. Don't forget, I've worked some of the problems out in a separate PowerPoint. So if you need some help with that, check that out too. All right, talk to you soon.